Markers and Milestones, where we explore educational opportunities for young men and women beyond traditional college, all from a Christ Center perspective. I am Lee Bortons, and I'm here with Amanda Kleista, my co-host. Today's April 10th, 2023. And Amanda, why don't you welcome our guest? Well, I'd like to welcome Laura Barth and Mr. Robert Barth to the program, and they're from Oak Brook Law School. And today's conversation, we're going to be exploring this with them. And uh, Laura, would you introduce yourself first? I know usually we would ask uh, Mr. Barth to introduce himself first, but introduce yourself first and tell us how you first started at Oak Brook, and then we'll ask Mr. Barth to introduce himself. Certainly. Well, thank you, ladies, for having us on the podcast. I appreciate this opportunity. So I um, kind of grew up always knowing about Oak Brook College of Law, uh, my dad being one of the founding faculty members. I was blessed to kind of be in the in the midst of you know hearing what was going on with uh, the law school. When I graduated high school, just kind of spent some time leading up to high school graduation, praying about what the next step was and where God was leading and didn't have specific clear direction. And so I, um, my dad and I were talking about the paralegal program at that time, which is a one-year certificate. And so I did that right out of high school, which really gave me a solid foundation entering adulthood as far as understanding, you know, law that we deal with on a daily basis, whether that's contracts, you know, if you buy a car, real estate, if you, you know, rent an apartment, and obviously constitutional law. So I appreciate the foundation that I got in that arena, also knowing that as a paralegal, it's a marketable skill. A few years ago, I was offered a position at a law firm with one of our OBCL JD graduates. And so I came out to California and then an opportunity opened up to work at the law school. So now I'm here at the law school. Thank you, Laura. And I really wanted to highlight that you didn't really know what your next step was right after you finished high school. And this was a bridge for you or and sort of an alternative than the ordinary college experience that you explored. So, Mr. Robert Barth, I would love for you to introduce your program and who you are. And if you could tell me about your educational background, just so people get a sense of who founded this. Absolutely. And thank you again for having us. This is a real joy. And so, you know, after 25 years, 27 years, this has been a, a passion and a ministry for all these years. And I'll tell you a little bit about my background. First of all, the educational. And then I'd like to tie in the spiritual because that kind of leads into the Oak Brook College of Law. Um, Laura is my daughter, as you know, and uh, we have had a wonderful family. We have 10 children and they all have been home educated. But, and I was a lawyer, of course, uh, I graduated from law school, you know, 40 years ago. But my educational background was not necessarily preparing for to be a lawyer. I was raised on a farm and actually got a bachelor's in science degree in agriculture from the University of Illinois. And then I, contemplated what I wanted to do, and I was either going to go to grad school in agricultural economics or go to law school because I thought, you know, I might be able to help uh, lawyers or far farmers in the, ag in, in, uh, in the, agri in the law legal, ag legal area, whether it was contracts, estate planning, uh, all kinds of things. So that was a suggestion made to me when I was in college, so I pursued that, and in college then after I graduated from law school, I practiced for a few years. And then I went on to get a master's degree in public policy from what is now Regent University. Back then it was called CBN University in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I've also have some Bible training. Now I, I lead into that because the spiritual background here, when I started law school, I was a very confused young man, even though I'd been through an undergraduate program. And I don't think that confusion among young people is limited between the time that they're in high school to college. Uh, many young people, of course, they're still asking that question, what am I supposed to do with my life even after they graduate from college? So I still was in that, that mindset. But when I got to law school, it was a very challenging program, much different than I anticipated because I really had no legal experience or legal background whatsoever. And so it was uh, an experience that really brought me to my knees, so to speak. 
And one night I was uh, <clears throat> really confused and I just cried out to God and asked him to share, to show me what I was supposed to do, whether I was supposed to stay in law school or not stay in law school. Well, God just really met me that night and I experienced him in a new way. And I guess you'd say that's where I surrendered my life to God. Well, after that, I decided, okay, well, does God have anything to say about law? <laughs> and <clears throat> having been raised in a secular uh, you know, perspective in terms of undergrad, and of course, the university I went to for law school is certainly not a biblical-minded uh, university. And so I began to ask that question, and that was a nagging question throughout law school, and then also after that. And when I heard about the School of Public Policy, that just really, I had such a witness to that. So my master's degree in public policy was, to me, was really an advanced law degree. I learned so much about the jurisdictional perspective of law, the biblical and historical foundations of law, that really was the, if you will, the impetus, part of the impetus for Oak Brook College of Law. Now, Oak Brook College of Law began in 1995, we had our first class in 1995, but it was really incorporated out of its desire to provide an alternative way for people to get a legal education, particularly those individuals who are home educated. Rather than going through four years of undergraduate school and then three years of law school, there was an opportunity and we saw a way to start a law school to enable home educated young people to go directly from high school into law school. California is the only state that enables a person to do that by via taking a couple, some, some CLEP exams, which are equivalent to, uh, a, a, for example, um, a junior college level or you know, uh, an associate's degree level. And you can go from right, high school right into law school. So that's how it began really as a means of home educated young people to go into law school and avoid, or what should I say, um, eliminate the, all of the expense and the cultural influences of secular education uh, of undergraduate and then also in law school. So you really, had the vision to provide a place where people could step into a law school style program without having to go through that secular doorway that you went through yourself to come into a law school. And you also have a heart for the home educated families. Um, and that was the impetus, it sounds like, for the starting of Oak Brook Law School. Did we capture that? Well, that is true. It was, I was not the only one. Um, I actually, after I went through the public policy program, the master's degree program, I was asked to stay on at the law, at the Regent University, CBN University, and help start the law school there in uh, 19, what was that, 1986. Uh, and I was working there and I worked there until 1995. But in that period of 19 up to leading up to 1995, there were others uh, who were involved in the home education movement who had had this vision. And I was asked to join in it because I already was teaching at a law school or being involved in the, you know, the starting of a law school. So it was a group effort. It certainly wasn't my idea, but I was happy to have involvement from the very beginning in, in that uh, program. And then I left Regent University um, in 1995 and uh, helps continue on and, and uh, develop the Oak Brook College of Law. Well, that was quite the journey. And um, the biblical worldview that, or Christ centered worldview that you talked about bringing into the law school, I guess one of my questions I have is. So did you choose the name Oak Brook Law because of something in the Bible, or is there some other image you want us to hear, have and hear about it? Um, how did we get the name Oak Brook? And then I'll jump into something else. Okay. Well, one reason for the Oak Brook College of Law is based upon Psalm 1, uh, which says, if you meditate on the law of the Lord day and night, you shall be like a tree 
playing it by the rivers of water. And the deep roots that one can get by meditating in, on scripture uh, really established the foundation for success. And that was one reason from Oak Brook. You know, an oak is a very strong tree. And if it has deep roots and a, deep roots and it's near a water supply, then it's going to survive no matter what the weather conditions are like. And the other thing is that the group of people who helped start the Oak Brook College of Law were associated with another ministry that actually had a, a, a location in Oak Brook, Illinois. So it was a combination mm. of things, but we like to look at the biblical foundation because that really is the, the solid foundation that is true for everybody. Uh, we know that promise, uh, whatever you do shall be successful. And so that's what we've based our um, Oak Brook College name on. So Oak Brook College, deep roots in scripture. Tell me either, maybe Laura, you could tell me about the two different programs that you've mentioned. You've been through one, you work for one. Tell me about those. So certainly the paralegal program is a one-year certificate where we cover a lot of the arenas, you know, areas of law, like real estate, constitutional law, criminal law, uh, you know, different things like that. I think there's about 16 different areas, legal research and writing, giving a overview of those arenas. And then also, you know, equipping a student to take the National Association of Legal Assistance, their national exam. So our graduates after our one year certification program can become a certified paralegal. And so we have some, you know, working in that arena, whether that's in the private sector with a law firm or in the um, nonprofit arena of, you know, supporting organizations that are doing more constitutional law type work. And so the paralegals are helping there. So that's our, our paralegal one year certificate program. For our JD program, it is a four year program online. Um, where they are able to go through the program. They go more in depth on the topics of law that they're studying. There are some in-person workshops that we do have. We host yearly. So we do get our students together. It's not exclusively online. Um, so they, some people ask, well, what about interaction when you're wanting to you know, connect with your classmates and stuff like that? So we have them connect in person at the beginning of each academic year. And then they do mock trial, um, oral arguments. They get to meet upperclassmen, interact with different students from different years. And so it's just really neat to see how they grow, challenge each other as they go through the program. And once they're you know, done with that four-year program, they're able to sit for the California bar. And you mentioned the California bar, and I guess I'm going to ask the very simple question. It's mm -hmm. online, but it's the California bar. Help sort that out for me, please. So our program um, is online. The California bar exam is a exam that you know individuals have to take in order to be licensed to practice law in a state. And so our program qualifies the students to you know take the California bar, become licensed California attorneys. Other states have different requirements in which you know they set up how they can you know practice law in that state. So we've had had some students you know transfer to other states based on their their rules and regulations there. Um, Wisconsin being one of them, North Carolina, a few others. As far as if they've practiced in California for a little while, they can sit for another state bar. Um, constitutional law is a little more open because it's a federal matter. So there's people practicing in D.C. with like Alliance Defending Freedom, um, different organizations like that. Thanks for helping sort that out a little bit. Lee, what questions have you been thinking about? Well, you guys are really inspiring. So I'm going to backtrack on some things you said and get clarity for myself and hopefully for our listeners too. So um, uh, uh, Mr. Barth, while you were talking, you used the past tense a lot. And I just wanted to make sure that everything you described about Oak, um, Oak Bridge, right, is still uh, in Oakbrook. existence. Oh, Oak Brook. I knew those were was there. We said a bridge program. That's what threw me. Yeah, that, that Oak Brook still is it, it still is online and it's still uh, meeting the needs that the, the California bar. Is it the same professor, same staff? Like what kind of transitions have occurred since you described the beginnings of it? What would you meet now if you went there? 
the same thing that Laura described. Initially, mm -hmm. it was set up as a code correspondence school. And mm -hmm. but That's now we have. Word. Pardon? <laughs> That's an old word. <laughs> yes, <laughs> correspondence school. But you know, back then, 1995, um, there were not too, there were no online law schools. In fact, it was just either correspondence or in residence school. That was it. Yeah. And as technology developed, then of course we had the means to have more online type of uh, training. Now, from the very beginning, our students actually had lectures they listened to. It, uh, they didn't listen to them online per se. They listened to them, first of all, it was VHS tapes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they went to cassette tapes. And then we actually have those uh, re lecture recordings now online so they can listen to them online. And so it is a uh, online program in that sense. And we, 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 as Laura mentioned, we get our students together once a year for different events, particularly uh, we call it the law school orientation and it's a review class for the students who just finished their first year. And we also, during that week, we have appellate advocacy training and with mock arguments. We also have trial advocacy that week. We actually have a review course for people who are just going to be finishing or who are near the end of their four years so that they can prepare for the bar exam. And then we have graduation and we have alumni activities. So that's our big uh, week when combine all that into one week. So as far as the faculty, we have, I guess myself and another faculty are the only two remaining fa uh, charter faculty. And, uh, but we've had, you know, different faculty over the years. And if not most of them, if not all of them, were very familiar with home education and uh, you know, got involved in the program part of that for, for that, partly that reason, where they wanted to be, you know, help young people uh, take this alternate route, if you will. And just to follow up a little bit what Laura says, there are one of the things I encourage young people to do, if they have any interest whatsoever in law or policy or what's happening in the world, politics, whatever. And they don't really know if they wanna go actually to law school because that's a big commitment. I encourage them to do a paralegal program, get a background in law because as Laura mentioned it, no matter what you do, you're involved in law in some way or another, whether you're just in a family or in a church or in a small business or your own, you, know, you, you, you deal with law every day. And we've had a number of students who, after they completed the paralegal program, they said, yes, this is something I really enjoy. This is something I want to go into more. And then they go into the law school and they do very, very well because they've got that one year paralegal background. So to answer your question, Lee, I think that the, um, the program is essentially the same. Uh, now we do Zoom calls, though, which were not possible mm -hmm. years ago. And we probably have, well, we have more faculty interaction now than we used to have. Uh, it used to be just telephone calls mm -hmm. or emails. And of course, at the beginning, emails weren't even, <laughs> weren't even there right. uh, uh, initially. So it's developed over the years as technology has changed and we can have much more interaction with our students. And believe it or not, the students are very close to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having taught and being involved in another law school years ago, uh, I find that the student interaction and the camaraderie and you know, a certain number of marriages even have developed out of Oak Brook College, uh, they get close and it, it's really a bond that uh, is very, very positive and very, very healthy. And we have a very strong alumni association as a result of that. Well, I'd like to know more about that, but I still have two more questions. The one is, is the paralegal program also online? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. And then the other one is uh, you can spend some more time explaining. You used the word CLEP in there, Mr. Barth. Can you uh, explain to our audience what's a CLEP exam or a CLEP course? Well, there's a pro, it's called college level, level uh, what, entrance? Examination program. Examination program. Thank you, Laura. We use acronyms sometimes. I forget <laughs> what they are. Um, so the college level examination program. And as anyone who looks at college or junior college, they know that oftentimes they can take exams 
to get advanced standing or to get credit for a course, even though they haven't taken the course in school. So the CLEP program or the college level examination program enables a student to take uh, and take tests as and to take tests in whether it's humanities or economics or math or grammar or English. And there are certain CLEP, certain tests that the California bar requires. And then there's just a certain number of hours have to be earned, credit has to be earned through those CLEP exams. And that's so let me all interrupt you there. So the, so the California bar is saying, since you're not going to a traditional kind of state approved college, there's some CLEP courses they want to be sure you have before you take the bar? Well, they, they, that's a requirement even to enter law school. You have to have the equivalent of, what is it, Laura, 30 hours of... Um, so if I have 60, a 17 year old- 60 hours, old, Lauren knows more about that than I do. Well, how about Lauren? So here's my question. So say I have a 17 year old and they're interested in doing the uh, JD four year program. You're saying there's some CLEP courses they have to take before they even go into your um, to the JD program? Yes, so California, the California bar has what they call pre-legal education requirements. Um, generally with a ABA American Bar Association College, that's with your, with your undergrad degree. You know, you've got your bachelor's, um, but the California bar has given provision for other ways for an applicant to meet those pre-legal requirements. Bachelor's degree is one of them. An associate's degree is one of them. Um, 60 credits of college or 60 hours of college credit um, or through CLEP testing, which would be 18 credits of, you know, it's 18 college credits that you get through CLEP testing, which is kind of like advanced placement testing, where instead of taking a math course, if you um, are really like math is your aptitude, you take this CLEP test. And if you pass it, they're like, you know what, instead of studying through the class, we're going to give you the credit because you've shown your competence in this area. So California has like four different ways that you can meet what they have as the pre-legal um, education requirements before entering law school. And the fastest Thanks, way to do that is through the CLEP testing because you only need 18 credits. Well, thanks for clearing that up because um, one of the uh, CC graduates actually has used your program. And so I learned a little bit about it while she was going through it, but mm -hmm. I never had all the details. So thank you. Certainly. Mm -hmm. So I have more, Amanda, but you go. What do you got? What questions well, do you have for so, me? Well, so, you know, I have looked at your website and I've had conversations with you and you talk about the biblical foundation for the way you study law. And I guess my question for you is what does that look like when it is to the student, when they're experiencing the course? How do you bring biblical principles into the foundation of law? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> and I have to go back since I studied law from a very secular perspective. In fact, in law school, believe it or not, the question, what is law is never answered. And you may, you may take jurisprudential courses, but those are usually electives and most students don't take those. And most people are uh, come away from law school with the perspective that law of law, that it's just an instrument to accomplish what those in power want to accomplish. Some call that an instrumentalist approach to law, that those in power are gonna use the law to accomplish their goals. Well, I mean, you can have honorable goals, but you can have, not so honorable goals. And so if your law, if your perspective of law that is just an instrument, then that has no objective standard behind it. It's just a matter of power. And so when I started, uh, you know, studied law, and then I asked the question, well, what does God have to say? Or what's the Bible have to say about law? I had no one to teach me. And that's why when I got into the program of public policy and was uh, mentored by a man who had a dramatic conversion, a Harvard Law graduate, and he uh, shared his testimony and his teaching is just so dynamic. I understood then what a biblical perspective of law is, that there are absolutes. There are, law must be derived from a value system and a standard of more right and wrong. And so what it's no longer a sacred secular mindset and that's a very greek mindset if you will that there's some things in culture that are sacred and there's some things in culture that are secular well law by definition from a biblical perspective uh 
it encompasses both quote secular quote secular and sacred in the sense that it's not just secular law is not just secular because it involves moral values so when we teach our law students one of the things that we have in particularly the first year courses and the second year courses which are primarily the common law courses um, based upon English common law, we have, for example, we have black quotes from William Blackstone, who wrote Blackstone's commentaries. And he, while he is, of course, not anything to do with American law, American law is based upon the English common law. And therefore, to get the commentary and the, and the perspective of law at that particular point in time in the nation's history was very important. So we learn and Blackstone was a, uh, you know, he's, he defined law, for example, as uh, a rule of action imposed by a creator upon the created, commanding what is right, and prohibiting what is wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything in Blackstone had the biblical worldview. And so we're able to infuse that in our students and help them understand that the value system in this country and the American legal system is rooted in the scriptures in terms of standards of what is right and what is wrong. And we could go through, you know, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all the different principles that were incorporated by our founding fathers into those legal documents. Now there's a debate, for example, whether all the founders were Christian or not. Well, I don't think they were, but I don't know. <laughs> Who can answer that question? But we do know based on the legal documents that they incorporated biblical principles into those documents, particularly the Declaration of Independence. And one of the things that we did, I did a year or so ago was I had a series of emails called Advocates of Truth, where I actually went into the Declaration of Independence and, and talked about the truth principles that were incorporated into the Declaration of Independence. And most, if not all of those, I think are on our website. I have a question. Do you know um, Carrie Morgan? I so certainly do. Very well. Yeah, we've had him, we had him on our other podcast two months ago for an hour. He's super interesting. I'm guessing from what you just said, you guys agree on a lot of things. Well, Carrie um, was in the class ahead of me in the School of Public Policy. Mm -hmm. And so Carrie is a good friend. I don't have much contact with him, except I did see him in person a year or so ago. When we actually went to the memorial service of Herbert W. Titus, mm -hmm. who was our dean and yeah. mentor. He was, he was our mentor, Carrie and I, both of our mentors. And I actually had the privilege of being his graduate assistant or teaching assistant for a number of years, all the time that I was there until 1995. So yes, I know Carrie. <laughs> That's great. I knew you had to. So I guess I really appreciate you saying how you see the foundation of law and took us back to Blackstone and took us back to the English roots. My question for either Laura or for you, Mr. Barth, is how do students in your program benefit their local church or how are you nurturing that? Because you've said biblical worldview, you said that it's not just about the schooling, it's about morals. So how does that function or work out in your program? I can speak to that a little bit because I'm in connection with the alumni. Um, so it really, as you know, with a biblical worldview, having that as your foundation when you approach law, um, I was blessed to walk along or be in a firm where I saw the attorneys, you know, walk through the clients who were going through a crisis and just how they did it in a very honoring way, you know, honoring the person as somebody created in the image of God and just walking them through that in a dignified way. So that's kind of more in the, in their, if you will, secular, but yet they were bringing in the aspect of acknowledging that, you know, people are created in the image of God and we're going to, you know, treat them as such. Um, some of our alumni are involved in their church as far as, you know, being involved in different um, board positions. Um, some organizations need an attorney on their board, and so they've been able to um, be able to, you know, bring that to the table and help with ministry in that regard. Um, I know some have gone into mediation, so more on the, you know, instead of 
actual law and litigation and that kind of stuff, more the reconciliation part of it. Um, so that's kind of, I think, some of the ways that they can be involved in their community and in, in their church. And Amanda, if you were asking about the students themselves, how we encourage them to maintain their contacts with their church, of course, we very much encourage that. And uh, there's one of the, the book I wrote, How You're Renewing Your Mind as You Study Law. I talk about the fact initially that it's very, laws, studying law is very dangerous in the sense that you, be, you can become, because if you have the ability to think, you can start rationalizing a lot of things and you can start developing opinions and questioning everything uh, and, and become critical in, the, in a, maybe in a negative sense. We have to be critical, critical thinking, but not to be critical in a negative sense. And I, I just think that if, you know, pe people, we encourage people, you know, don't, don't, you don't, you don't have to study on Sunday or one day a week, you know, spend, you absolutely have to spend time with your family. You have to spend time in church and activities. And uh, we strongly encourage that. And in addition on our lessons, for example, not only do we quote Blackstone on the common law courses, but we actually, actually in our some syllabi for each lesson, we give a biblical analysis of that particular concept. I teach contracts and you kind of wonder what in the world is the biblical foundation of contracts? Well, you'd be surprised there's a great deal about contracts based on the fact that we are created in God's image and whatever God said and created is good and we know that God cannot lie therefore we have to uphold our word even to our own hurt there's so much there in terms of the biblical approach to contract law tort law property law uh, business organizations constitutional law of course now there's some other courses like in the Uniform Commercial Code or the Tax Code, well, there may not be as much uh, scripture applicable uh, to those, but we certainly try to uh, talk about that if there is uh, some applicability. So let me ask you, so if I was taking a course like that, I would probably be your worst student because I would push back on everything that came through the state and would say, wait a minute, why are we obeying this law? Who's not fighting it? Like, is there that opportunity to let the students know they can be changers? They don't have to go along with precedent or previous laws. They can help write better laws. Or well, absolutely. In fact, we challenge students. Not only do we teach what every other law school would teach, but we challenge them to think biblically and think jurisdictionally. So they will do that very thing. And we have some people who like you know, who really are called to litigation, whether it's Alliance Defending Freedom or some other types of litigation groups are in private practice. Mm -hmm. But other graduates, they, um, they, they like more of an office practice. They feel more to, to be involved in the community. A lot of, uh, we have graduates who are very much involved in immigration law, helping those, uh, you know, helping the outcast and get uh, political asylum uh, uh, claimants or, you know, people who've been persecuted. Uh, to, into the country or whatever. There's, there's, legal, I always say law provides more opportunity for ministry than probably any other profession, mm -hmm. and more opportunities to to express your gifts. Whether you are, you know, someone who really likes confrontation, <laughs> yeah. or you know, mediation, or you just like an office practice, or you like to research, or you mm -hmm. you like to help people. I mean, it, it provides such a connection with a community too in a church i mean uh you know if you're involved in church and you're an attorney it's not long before somebody starts asking you questions about different things in their lives so um i don't know if that answered your question but that's that it does so how do you vet your professors how do you make sure your staff is continuing the message that your founders you know that mission drift how do you avoid that mm -hmm. Uh, well, our professors, you know, we have a mission statement. We have a, a statement of faith. And uh, it's pretty uh, easy to determine where people are in terms of their, their background, their spiritual background, and where they stand. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's pretty easy to de determine that. If someone just wants to be a, a, a law professor, um, 
first of all, most of our professors are, um, some of them actually volunteer <clears throat> and some are they're certainly not paid as much as maybe you certainly would have in another law school, but because they view it as a ministry and they view it as helping uh, young people. And really our mission is training advocates based on the three roles of Christ as an advocate, our mediator, and our ultimately our uh, judge, if you will, that we train people to be involved in those areas, advocates, you know, counselors of, of truth, uh, counselors of media, advocates of truth, counselors of reconciliation, and ministers of justice, mm -hmm. so that you know, there's an area there for all the students, however they choose, and sometimes they're involved in all of them. And one of our law professors was just, uh, he's just became a judge in California. And so now he's changing on a, taking on a different role, but he's still going to be allowed and, and, uh, and be able to teach for us. Mm -hmm. So Laura, can I ask you a question? What was your favorite course that you took during your certification? And, and um, what, tell us a story about how you either enjoyed the professors or enjoyed the students since it was online. Yeah, so I, oh, my favorite course. Um, probably, probably real estate law. Um, just, I, I don't, there's something about home ownership that I think is, is fun and exciting. And so I think, that was kind of piqued my curiosity in that arena. Um, maybe down the road, I'll get my real estate license. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, you know, interacting with the professors, I was blessed when I went to the program to kind of have an in-house professor right there. Um, and so it was, for me, it was a little bit different because I could ask my dad um, some questions. But I think it was yeah, those were my two, you know, the, the real estate was probably my favorite one. Of course, I enjoyed constitutional law as well but um you know interacting with that our students with the paralegal program um connecting with the, the paralegals don't actually have to come to the in-person conference so it's a little bit more challenging to connect um but it was still i i enjoyed it good so do you have so is your dad your favorite professor or are you just saying oh, by that far he's here <laughs> and uh, by far yeah yeah and okay. on you know on that note of the professors you know with my role as director of student services i'm able to interact with the students Mm -hmm. as well as interact with the professors. And mm -hmm. I have truly been able to see their heart. I mean, the professors do it because they view it as a ministry mm -hmm. and they have a passion to raise up the next generation of you know people to make an impact in the legal profession, in the business profession, whatever God's calling them to, you know, in accordance with, you know, Ephesians uh, 2.10, you know, where is workmanship created for good works? Mm -hmm. And that is the professor's passion, all, all of them, you know, that I have seen where they, they don't do it because they want, you know, it on their resume to, you know, boost their, you know, standing or whatever. They do it because they love the students and they love to invest in the next generation. So I'm blessed to see that. And I have had so many students say, oh, I love this professor. They totally gave me time and just really helped me through it. So it's really, it's really a blessing to see that. The heart behind. Yeah, either, does either the staff or the um, students have to sign a statement of faith? So yeah, with our enrollment agreements, there is, um, you know, they agree to uh, get an ed education consistent with our statement of faith. So yeah, there's, there's that, that is in the paperwork. Okay. And also all of our, all of our faculty are, are actually have our practicing lawyers. So mm -hmm. they, they do this in addition to their uh, practice. That's nice. Mm -hmm. So that keeps them fresh. Mm -hmm. yes. Amanda, do you have some more questions? Well, so you know, you started talking about applications and statements of faith and things like that. So let's say somebody wants to do the one-year paralegal. What are the dollar signs? How can they get the money in like really short? Give us that bullet point. <laughs> Certainly. Um, so for the one-year paralegal program, it's um, about $5,000 tuition and fees. And then they are responsible for getting their books. So we send them a text list of books that they are responsible to get. And the application's all online. So you can fill it out, come back to it and finish filling it out um, for the, yeah. So that's the paralegal program, the one-year certificate. You're looking at about 5,000, you know, 5,500. And then you have a very marketable skill when you're done. And that's yeah. just the online. There's no room and board. This is just going correct. to have the experience of yes. getting access to this paralegal program. Okay. That is correct. Yes. All right. There's something else you guys offer. Yeah. Yeah, so the JD program is uh, 10,000 a year, 
and that covers the tuition, the fees, and actually room and board for our in-person conference. And then um, students just have to pay for their travel costs to and from the conference, and then books, and then any um, fees associated with the California bar. So a few years ago, I did a survey of some of our graduates, and that's one of the motivations with our school is getting graduates obviously with a law degree, but also in a position to be able to do that ministry, to be able to take on pro bono work and not be saddled with a law school debt that they have to feel like they have to go, you know, big corporate and not be able to do the ministry that they really want to. So our, you know, with our JD program, 10,000 a year. So that's, you know, 40,000 for your JD degree. And most people can, you know, do that. We have a payment plan. So it's very doable. When I did a survey of our applic or our JD graduates and how many graduated debt free. It was like ninety eight percent graduated debt free. Um, over three hundred, you know, graduates we have. So it's very doable. We want to launch them successfully academically, but also practically on the financial side. I have another question. So um, you keep talking about the paralegal credit. Is it actually accredited by somebody or is it your reputation that is your um, accreditation? So we are licensed with the private and post-secondary um, education organization here. Um, well, I think it's national in California for sure. Um, so we're, we're registered with them. And then our program qualifies the students to take the National Association of Legal Assistance um, exam, national exam. So the paralegal is national mm -hmm. as far as being able to be a paralegal in any state and the JD is more California specific, but there's um, other opportunities depending on what law the, the graduate wants to practice. Because one of the purposes of this podcast is to break the idea that you have to go to an accredited college to go anywhere. And there's more and more unaccredited colleges showing up because, you know, the whole accreditation process is what allowed the wokeism to occur. Mm -hmm. Their standards weren't our standards. And so I just want parents to know that you, know, you can get these certifications, but in many ways, it's the bar exam or the NALA is what your, your marker is, is what your milestone is, rather mm -hmm. than the accreditation of the program that you're in. Mm -hmm. Would that be accurate for both the programs you've described or just the paralegal? I I mean it, it depends on who's looking at it, but I believe I believe that is an accurate statement. I think my dad might be able to speak more into it on the JD side of it, but as far as the paralegal, that's definitely an accurate statement. Well, and with respect to the law school, as Laura mentioned, each state has its own requirements as to what is necessary to become licensed in that particular state. Mm -hmm. And most states by the by Supreme Court, they have, if you will, delegated the duty of accrediting law schools to the American Bar Association. And so by default, the American Bar Association has a great deal of influence and control over who practices law and who doesn't, because most states require that you graduate from a school approved by the American Bar Association. And the American Bar Association will not accredit distance learning schools. The only type of schools that they will accredit are brick and mortar schools, three-year programs or two and a half year programs. Now, some states, and I think California is probably the, the leader in this, uh, is, is a state that actually will, independently of the American Bar Association, uh, receive applications for accreditation and they have their own standards for accreditation mm -hmm. by which they will accredit a law school within that state. And until very recently, those accreditation standards were limited also to brick and mortar schools. Now, prior to just recently, all schools such as ours, by the way, there's like 14 or 15 uh, unaccredited law schools in California that are distance learning or correspondence schools. And uh, until recently, though our, that type of school was not able to even apply for state accreditation. So now we have in California, we have schools that are approved by the American Bar Association. We have schools that are approved by the State Bar of California. And then we have schools that are licensed by the State Bar of California, but not actually approved per se. But nevertheless, even the unaccredited law schools in California have to have they have certain standards 
they don't become, we didn't, couldn't become licensed until we basically met all those, we met all those standards. And so there's just now a different um, uh, set of standards, a little bit more rigorous, not much more though, to actually get accredited by the state bar of California. So actually California has almost right at 50 law schools, believe it or not. And uh, 18 or so of those are ABA approved, another 17 or so are 18 or uh, state accredited law schools, and the remainder are actually unaccredited licensed law schools. But the difference in California between an accredited law school by the state and a registered law school uh, is nothing. You can both, they both take and qualify for the Cali, California bar. And, and uh, so it, it, in terms of their ability to take the California bar, or subsequently in North Carolina or Wisconsin or some other states, it doesn't matter whether you graduate from an ABA approved school or a state accredited school or even an unregistered, a registered school. Okay, I know that's well, a lot. No, no, it's important. And Amanda, you and I need to have a podcast that's only on all the various ways people do things. Yeah. Because, you know, you know, like people say to me all the time, well, I can't, in education, I'm not a certified teacher. And I'm like, Amanda's not certified. I'm not certified. No one's accredited for anything. And we make a really good living teaching, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, that's where I would be pushing back and saying, I don't care if the state of California says I'm a lawyer or not. God and I will decide if we're, uh, if I'm a lawyer. And I'll know it's true because my customers pay me well. Well, right? yes. And you may, you raise a good point there, Lee, about accreditation. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about what really is accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, in one sense, it follows a biblical principle that let another man praise you and not your own lips. Mm -hmm. But that's based upon criteria that they set out. And so <clears throat> they want to, uh, uh, most accrediting associations, they're looking at what you do and whether you actually do what you say you're doing. Mm -hmm. And but there's also their own individual standards that are set there that you have to comply with in order to get them to get their, you know, get their accreditation. And as we know, some of those accreditation standards can be somewhat uh, antithetical to the principles and values that we have or that individuals have. And therefore, uh, they don't necessarily care whether accreditation is part of the school's uh, recognition or not. And we all know many colleges that have not pursued um, secular, quote, secular type of accreditation uh, from different institutions. So accreditation is, you know, it, it all, if you really understand what it means, it, it doesn't mean as much as some people say it means. Now, if you're going to get, you know, if you're going to qualify for federally federally funded loans or you know student aid then you have to jump through those hoops and be accredited by a national accrediting association but you guys don't do that we do not right yay all right with that so, we need to be done julie and i have another podcast so i know you, you say something else go ahead yeah i do want to give them this opportunity if somebody wanted to learn more about where you're at can you say how they find you online and how they would reach out to you if they're curious to ask you more questions. For sure. So our web address is um, obcl.edu. That stands for Oak Brook College of Law.edu. And we're on social media as, at Oak Brook College of Law. So they can reach out to their, those avenues or info at obcl.edu. So thank you so much, Mr. Bars, and thank you so much, Laura, for coming on tonight. Thank you for sharing that, Lee. It was a delight to be with you as well. Thank yeah, and we'll you have so you back much. on to talk about other topics. Thanks so I'll much. I'll be Robert. happy to. This is this is great. There's no greater passion than I have than to help young people, uh, you know, pursue the calling that God has placed on their life. That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Thank you, thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye.
Oh, you already made it? 